and welcome. My name is Myron Wingfield, and I am the Associate General Secretary for the Division of Ordained Ministry at General Board of Higher Education and Ministry. And uh, today we're partnering with United Methodist Communications for this webinar titled Crisis Communication, What a DS Needs to Know. And with me today to guide us through this webinar is Diane Degnan. Diane is the Director of Public Relations for United Methodist Communications, and she's responsible for raising awareness of the mission and ministries of the United Methodist Church. She serves as a liaison uh, to the news media and seeks to maximize opportunities to tell our United Methodist story in both religious and secular press. And more to the point for today, uh, Diane has had 20 years of experience uh, working with media and has managed hundreds of crisis communication situations and done countless interviews as well. So she is uh, well prepared to guide us uh, through this, this presentation. And I want to say welcome and thank you, Diane. Thank you for inviting me and thanks for joining us today. Um, in my job here at United Methodist Communications, I work with people at all levels of the church who are facing communication challenges and crisis situations. So today you'll get some tips on what to do when you're facing a crisis to help you manage the situation and know what to do when a reporter calls so that you are prepared to speak confidently in the midst of a crisis. Now, if you're on Twitter and you tweet about today's webinar, um, we've got a crisis communications resource guide that will help you um, that's developed especially for churches. So the first 10 people who tweet about this webinar using one of the Twitter handles on the screen will get a free resource guide. So um, when we're talking about a crisis today, we're not talking about a natural disaster like a tornado or a flood. And we're talking about situations that threaten the reputation of the church and that trigger media or public interest. This could, crisis could be uh, something that happens suddenly or it's something that's kind of built up over time that you're knowing is going to going to come up. Um, it could be a situation that you have no control over, or it could be a situation where there's some perception that the, the church had a hand in creating it, either through a negligence or wrongdoing. Um, it, a crisis could take the form of violence, um, accidents, embezzlement, abuse, um, misconduct. It could just be a controversy that escalated out of control. But these are situations where we have a responsibility to communicate with our audiences. And oftentimes, it is the district superintendent who is the one who is called upon to respond to that crisis. Now, if you're facing a potential crisis, you want to be prepared to respond strategically. Uh, Will Rogers said it takes a lifetime to build a good reputation, but you can lose it in a minute. And how you communicate in these kinds of situations can make or break an organization where public perception is concerned. But being well prepared can help you avoid costly mistakes that lead to long-term reputation damage. And when a crisis occurs, it's especially important for the church to show the public that we're willing to do the right thing. Now, ideally, you want to be prepared to head off a potential crisis where it progresses. That's our goal is to prevent a crisis from happening. And that means don't ignore warning signs. You need to be aware of brewing situations at all levels and try to assess and respond to a potential crisis before it actually happens. You can't be aware of a brewing situation if you haven't told pastors and local churches that they need to make sure that they let you know when there's a situation that might attract community interest. You don't want to find out about that at the last minute. Um, also, your conference communicator is your partner in these situations, so make sure that they know that there's a situation that may potentially become a story because you want to consider the public relations impact of decisions the same way that you would consider the legal ramifications or the financial um, or cost of a, a situation. So, um, despite your best efforts, though, crisis situations are going to happen and there's just no way to completely avoid them. And this um, is right in line with what we have been talking about with the district superintendents uh, at the new DS training for the last two years since I've, I've been involved, and probably before that too. But um, I wanted to point out that this is very much in line with what Bishop Sandra Steiner Ball, uh, currently serving the West Virginia Annual Conference, has advised all of her uh, district superintendents uh, to then advise all of the clergy in the conference. That is to communicate, communicate, 
over communicate, especially if they see a potential crisis brewing. Um, the way she phrases it is, I want no secrets, no subversions, no surprises. Uh, if there's any way you can avoid surprising the, your colleagues in leadership, and especially the bishop, uh, take the initiative to do that. Keep them up to date. That's good advice. So the time to get prepared for, for a crisis is now before anything's ever actually happened. And the first thing that you're going to need to have is a plan. Your plan is the go-to place um, for must-have information. Um, things happen very quickly in a crisis, and you're not going to have time to put all that together. You need to know uh, what the media policy is, who should, who should talk, who should not talk, who should be notified. You need contact numbers for everyone that you might need to be uh, on your team, including home and cell phone numbers in case it happens after hours. Um, you need action steps for different categories of crisis, like a financial crisis or an accident. Um, even pre-scripted messages that you can adapt as necessary so that you don't have to start from scratch when you're trying to move very quickly. Developing a plan in advance of a crisis will save you time so that you can act more quickly, and it's going to give guidance to everyone who is involved. So if they already know what agreement has been made about who will do what. Um, and then find out if your annual conference already has a plan and make sure that you're familiar with it. Do your local churches have plans? Um, these are all things to think about in advance. Uh, I just have a question regarding that, and I think others out there might have the same question, is regarding the pre-scripted messages. If, if they were to do the United Methodist Communications Crisis Communications Training, is that part of it to, to provide uh, coaching and developing those pre-scripted messages? We do have uh, plan templates that we've developed specifically for churches and local church. There's a local church level plan. There's an annual conference level plan. Mm. It includes all of the things that you might need, and you can adapt it for your own needs. Good. Now, if you have a plan and no one knows about it, and that's the same thing as not having a plan. So if there's a plan out there and everyone who's on the crisis team or who has a role doesn't know about it, um, then you need to make sure that they're all familiar with it. Um, part of your plan is to form a crisis team who has different roles and responsibilities and Think about who you need on your team, and that may vary in, um, in a different type of crisis. You're going to need a team leader. You're going to need conference communication staff. You're going to need legal counsel. You might need safety and security personnel. Um, some crisis, you're going to want the church pastor uh, to be the, um, uh, a lay leader or the um, SPR chairman. It could, it's going to vary based on the type of crisis. Now, in a crisis, speed counts, and communicating in a crisis is a little bit like cooking a frozen turkey for a hungry family on Thanksgiving. Um, it's just not something that you can do very quickly. Yeah, especially if you're trying to deep fry it. That is a disaster. Yeah, that's a different kind of crisis. <laughs> we want to avoid those, but we want to be um, prepared to uh, respond quickly. So if you've got foreknowledge of a brewing crisis, then you've got some element of control. For example, you take control of when and how information is released. So if you have a situation where there is no doubt that the information is going to become public, then you want to disclose the information yourself and you want to do it as quickly as possible. So tell it yourself and tell it fast. But in other situations, um, you know, where information may or may not become known, then you're going to want to be uh, prepared so that you can answer quickly, but you may not um, you may not disclose the information yourself. Uh, for example, I was working with a church that they became aware that their pastor was going to be arrested, and they knew that was going to happen, and they were um, prepared with a, a response to that. But it actually happened late in the day, and um, no one was at the church when the, when the news media called. And there was no after-hours number given. And so when the story ran that night, um, they simply said that the church didn't return calls asking for comment. So they wanted to respond the next day, but the result of that was that the story went on for an additional day. Um, in order for them to give their response, then the information you know, that was negative got repeated again. So you want to get through the life cycle of your crisis as quickly as possible, and you don't want to create an additional day's news out of it. So being 
uh, not only being prepared with a message, but also making sure that there would be uh, a way for them to reach you when it happened would be important. Now, sometimes you're going to encounter a situation where there's a sudden crisis and you don't have time to prepare in advance. And so at those, in those cases when the media is at your door, you, you need a little bit of time to assemble some facts. And you can do that with a whole response, which is going to buy you just a little bit of time while you um, create your, your response. So here's an example um, of a whole response. We've just learned about this and are trying to get more information. We'll contact you as soon as we know more. We're preparing a statement on that now, and we'll be prepared to speak with you in about an hour. Um, reporters have deadlines, so it's important that you do call them back when you say that you will. But also members of the congregation may also be calling, and you need to make sure that the support staff who are taking calls also have a whole statement that they know what to say and where to refer media calls. Um, they can also create a log of calls if there's a lot of media calls. Um, I can share a, a story about um, a crisis that I um, handled uh, in my career, which is one of the uh, ones that um, created the most media interest. And I had about I had about 30 reporters call me within a day's time, and my administrative assistant was out that day, so didn't have anybody taking calls. And just the time that it took to listen to voicemails, to write down the messages and the numbers, and then to sort of um, prioritize those based on deadlines and, and who was calling. Um, took a lot of time, um, and if I'd had a backup plan at that point and someone else to help, then that would have saved a lot of time. So have a backup plan in case people on your team are out. Well, could you give us some other examples of what you would do to prepare a district superintendent's frontline staff for those sorts of situations? Sure, and um, that needs to be a part of your crisis plan. Um, everybody who's going to have a role needs to know what that is. So in your crisis plan, um, have a form to take those uh, telephone log for media mm -hmm. calls. Have a whole statement um, that refers the media exactly to where you want it to go, which uh, may potentially be the, the crisis, uh, the conference communicator or whatever your media policy says. But these are all things that you need to do in advance. And they could have that statement and have it right there in their desk. So it's mm -hmm. a good reminder if something happens. Mm -hmm. And then even some even some role play training, um, you know, could be helpful. So as you're training all of your staff on your crisis plan, then be, be sure not to forget those staff. Um, now, before you do anything else, it's important to assess the situation and get it under control. So that means your main emphasis is going to be on getting the facts. You need to ask some questions. And once you have all the available facts, then you can determine what other information you need and what needs to happen first, and then what needs to happen next, and who is going to do what. So that's where your crisis team comes in. You want to call your team together um, and make sure that everyone who needs to be notified is, is notified. That includes your bishop and your conference communicator. Um, and if things are happening quickly, you're not going to have time to do everything yourself. So you don't want anyone to be surprised. and um, Everyone needs to know what they are expected to do, and if they're not, if they're not available, then who is their, who is their backup? Now, as you begin to formulate your communication strategy, you're going to identify your various target audiences and determine which audiences have highest priority and what channels are you going to use to reach them. And the news media is not your only audience, so if there are victims in the crisis, then you'll need to communicate with them. And the more closely an audience is affected by the crisis, then the closer your communication to them should be. So, for example, in a, in a, um, if there are victims, then you're going to want to communicate with them face to face. Um, don't forget the people in the congregation, um, because different audiences have different concerns, and you need to have a plan for dealing with the concerns of each audience and determine how you're going to reach them, whether that's as a group, through an email, uh, through a phone call. Um, your website is a channel of communication that you control. Your social media channels are channels that you also control, where you can control your message. Uh, but you, you want, don't want people to find out through the news media if they should have found out um, earlier than that. For example, if you had a crisis involving a daycare center, you need to communicate with all the parents 
and do it as quickly as possible, either face to face or over the phone, so that they're the first to know. Mm -hmm. Um, generally, in a crisis, people want to know three things. Um, they want to know what happened, they want to know what you're going to do about it, and they want to know how you're going to prevent it from happening again. So uh, keep these things in mind as you determine the content of your message. So that's the next step is to develop your messages. Um, I recommend that you have three key message points, and that's in any kind of an interview, um, not just a crisis situation, because three things is about all that people are going to remember. And you don't want to deliver so many message points that the reporter has to pick and choose um, what they're going to report. So write down every possible message point that you can think of. And then cross them off until you come up with three most important things you want to say. And make them simple. Um, you want to be able to sum up all your key points very quickly, say within 15 seconds. So these are the the three ideas that you want to communicate. It may not necessarily be exactly how you're going to say them, but what are the three things that you want to communicate? When Diane and I were talking about this in preparation for the webinar, the way my logic followed what she just said was, well, maybe it's better just to get down to one point. But um, as I recall, your response is, that's really not enough, that you want to communicate enough to let folks know that you're covering it. Uh, so really three points is the right balance between Communicating enough, but not over, overloading them. Right, because remember, people want to know three things. They want to know what happened, they want to know how you're going to address it, and they want to know how you're going to prevent it from happening again. <laughs> so you're going to need more than one message point to address that. Uh, in addition to the content of your message, um, you need to choose the right messenger. So who will be the spokesperson? And that may be you or it may not be you, and it can vary can vary depending on the situation. Um, every situation is different. You want to think about who is the spokesperson who would best connect with the audience. Um, that person is going to be the face of your organization, the person who is going to take it you know, from just um, a bureaucratic um, organization to, to an actual human face. And that person is going to, you're going to want somebody who can, can convey caring and compassion and honesty and openness, um, because in a crisis, your communication is being judged. So uh, you need one, one spokesperson and one spokesperson only to speak with one voice to determine who was at is going to be, and that should be the only person who's talking to the news media about the situation. Um, sometimes there is an inclination to use a written statement, and a written statement um, is often perceived as um, you're hiding behind the statement. You're afraid to face the news media. Mm. And when you use a written statement, you miss out on um, the trust and credibility that a spokesperson can convey. Uh, when you communicate through just writing, you usually just get that one little slide on the news story. Um, and, and you can't convey the same um, tone of voice, facial expressions, um, things like that that help to build credibility um, because you're, the way that you convey the message is more important than the actual words within the message according to research. Um, you also want to use someone who has, um, who is comfortable talking to the news media and who understands um, what the news media is after. So uh, considering someone who is media trained or considering getting media training um, yourself, if you're often uh, going to be a spokesperson, or for other others in your area who you might use, um, it's helpful to get some media training. So when, when again in rehearsal when we were talking about this, what that clarified for me is that sometimes the district superintendent, since this is what the web, these, this is the crowd the webinar is aimed at, uh, sometimes the the DS is not going to be the right spokesperson, and that's where I think having a crisis team and uh, doing a lot of pre-planning uh, will help help figure out who would be our best spokesperson. And then there are going to be those times when, by virtue of the role, it really needs to be the DS. And that's just going to uh, have to be a decision that's best made by the team, uh, if possible, to see what, what is the situation, how's the best way to communicate that, and, and then answer the question, then who? Right, because we want to have a strategic response. Okay. We want to consider all of these all of these things that are important um, as we're determining, you know, what our plan of action is. 
Now, um, probably the most important thing that I could say to you about dealing with a crisis is to communicate with a purpose. If you're going to into a report, into an interview with a reporter just to answer the reporter's questions, then you don't have any reason to do that interview. You need to know um, what your objective is, what you're hoping to communicate, and what you want people to think or do as a, as a result of that. Um, and usually in a crisis, your, your objective is either to explain or to persuade. So know what you want to say, know how you want to say it. Um, you don't control the questions, but you do control the answers. You, can, you control what comes out of your mouth. And so you want to stick to positive language. Often reporters will phrase questions negatively, and you don't want to use that negative language even to refute it. So reframe it by, uh, reframe your answer using positive language. Be sure to make those key message points in every answer. You're not waiting for the reporter to ask you that question. You are um, finding ways to make those key points in your answers to their questions. Acknowledge problems, but focus on solutions. Uh, we're in a crisis situation. We're not denying that a problem exists. We're focused on how we're going to address it, how we're going to fix it. And then display what I call confident uncertainty. Confident uncertainty is, uh, if you're, while you're uncertain of the facts, you, you're confident that you're going to do the right thing. If you find a problem, that you will fix it. And you want to inspire conf the confidence of others that, that you're going to do the right thing, that you're going to do your best to fix it, and you're going to make amends. I, I really appreciate the phrase confident uncertainty. It, it's very much in line with what we've talked about at the district superintendent training for the last two years uh, about uh, especially from uh, Friedman's book about a failure of nerve uh, to, to project that centered, self-differentiated, calm presence. Uh, but most of the time you do that, you have to do it in uncertain circumstances. And so district superintendents get a lot of practice at this, <laughs> just in the normal course of things, I think. And people want their leaders, yeah. you know, they want their leaders to be confident. The, you know, that's the time in a crisis if you don't know everything that there is to know yet at that point. So expressing some confidence that you're going to do the right thing is a good response. Um, now, in addition to your three key messages, you want to express concern for victims. So Mark Twain said, people will need to know that you care before they care what you know. And that is especially true in a crisis situation. So the first thing you're going to want to do right off the bat is to make a statement of concern or empathy for victims or others affected by the crisis. And here's how you could do that. Um, when you get the first question of the interview, you can just take control of the interview and say, first, let me just say that, um, you know, everyone who is affected by this, this crisis is in our thoughts and our, and our prayers or something similar to that so that you've set the tone of the interview of, as one of concern. Now, the questions you're going to get in an interview are generally pretty predictable. They're pretty much the same in every crisis because the media is universally focused on the negative. And in a crisis, they're going to ask you what happened. They're going to ask who's to blame. They're going to ask um, how you, it could have been prevented. Um, do you accept responsibility for it? Has it happened before? Um, what's it going to cost? Um, all of these things. So. In preparing for your interview, you're going to anticipate those questions, and then you're going to develop your answers. And, and these will be answers that incorporate your key messages. So they're not separate things. You're incorporating them in every answer. And you're going to do that uh, using a technique called bridging. Bridging is when you touch on the answer to the question, and then you bridge to your one of your key messages. Um, in a way that makes sense by using phrases like uh, what's important to remember is, or the biggest issue here is, or let me point out that, um, our goal is, um, here's what I can tell you. These are bridging phrases. And you're not waiting for good questions. You're not waiting for the, the reporter to ask you a question that allows you to get your message in. You're making your point in every answer by using a transitional phrase. Um, and that way it doesn't matter which answer is used in the interview, and generally only one answer is, is likely to be used, sometimes two. It doesn't matter which one because you're making your key points in every answer. In talking about this, I, I thought that a good way to, 
to study this and to learn it is to watch politicians in news interviews and also in debates. They do they use those same bridging techniques. So in the the debate moderator, for instance, um, poses a question. They have a very skilled way of using these bridging phrases to get back to the point they want to make. And if you know those message points and keep them in mind, then you'll find that it's not that difficult, but it does take some practice. So, um, so practice ahead of time. But the important thing to remember is that you are not avoiding the question. You are not just not answering the question. You're going to answer the question, and then you're going to go to your key points in a way that's relevant and makes sense using one of these bridging phrases. And this is important in every kind of interview. Uh, whenever you're, um, you have an opportunity to talk about um, good things that are going on, to know how to use those questions to get to, to your points and not just answer the question. Um, sometimes you're going to get questions that you can't answer directly. But you never want to answer a question with no comment. Um, when you can't answer a question because of a, um, a situation that's confidential, maybe it's a personnel situation and your personnel policy is that you don't speak about those things publicly, or maybe it's an unconfirmed um, situation or it's a, there's a lawsuit pending and you can't talk about it, then you, you still don't want to say no comment. You want to briefly explain why you can't answer and then share what you can say. And that's where the bridging phrases also come in. So you can always talk about process if you can't discuss specifics. For example, um, I can't talk about this specific case because um, there's a, a lawsuit pending, but I can tell you here's what our policy is. When something like this happens, we immediately do three things. Or, um, because this is a personnel issue and it's unconfirmed, I can't talk about it at this time. But here's what I can tell you: um, we're committed to uh, whatever the higher, whatever the higher um, objective is of your interview, and and not talk about the specific, specifics of that situation. To talk about how those situations are generally handled, um, use confident uncertainty. Um, I can't talk about this situation, but we're going to take care of it. Now, sometimes there's going to be a situation where there's actually some fault, um, and, and in that case, apologies can be powerful. Uh, people are more willing to forgive when you take responsibility, you admit mistakes, um, and don't try to blame others. So you want, to, you want to say what happened and why it happened, what you're going to do about it, and then if there's a way to make amends where possible. Um, Consider if there are ways to rectify the situation. And what would the what would the public relations perception be? What would your audience think that you should do? Um, you know, is it a situation where um, you should offer something additional, like um, counseling for victims, or um, something to show that you are trying to make the situation uh, right for the victim? Now, uh, an interview is not a conversation. So you don't want to be conversational. Because um, in a conversation, everything that is said uh, contributes to the meaning and the understanding uh, between those who are having the conversation. But in an interview, everything that you say will not be heard. It will only be heard by you and the reporter, and they're not going to use all of your answers. In fact, you might get at best about a 10-second quote or less. So every answer has to stand alone. Um, a lot of times people will say that they were misquoted, um, and usually they weren't misquoted, but their quote was taken out of context. In an interview, you already know that your quote is going to be taken out of context because it's not a conversation. So be sure that your answers can stand on their own. Every answer has to stand on its own, incorporate the question in the answer. Um, in a conversation, you generally lead up to make your point at the end. But in an interview, you're going to start out by saying the most important thing first. That's, that's a pattern of communication that pastors in general and district superintendents in particular are not accustomed to, to using. And so I would imagine that takes a lot of practice. It does take some right. practice. And that's why media training is helpful. <clears throat> um, and in media training, you generally get an opportunity to, um, to do some practice exercises. When we do media training, we use uh, situations that are actually relevant to the mm -hmm. people in the in the classes, so that you're not talking about a 
situation that you wouldn't ever actually be in, but mm -hmm. something that might be tailored to the participant. Mm -hmm. But here's how you can um, here's how you can answer a question. I mean, you're going to start off by saying the most important thing first, or the conclusion, and then you're going to briefly elaborate using supporting facts, specific examples. Um, Statistics or anecdotes. This is the evidence that your conclusion is true. What backs up what you say? And then lastly, you want to help the audience to understand what that means or how they're going to be affected or what comes next. So put the information into perspective for them. Help them know what you want them to think or feel as a result of that or what they should do. So here's an example. Um, if, let's say you had a financial crisis. You might say, we're committed to being good stewards of the funds entrusted to us. We took immediate action to suspend the employee when we learned about the, the funds were taken. And um, we're reviewing our financial policies to ensure they're as effective as possible. If we find that revisions need to be made, um, we'll do that to ensure a high level of financial integrity. So kind of a three-part answer. Um, don't take too long or, or they'll take them the middle part of your answer out and, and edit it. So try to sum it up very quickly. Now, just a few interview don'ts. Um, don't get defensive and don't get angry. You want to keep your cool no matter what. So these are situations that are sometimes highly emotionally charged, but you want to keep your cool. Um, don't speculate. If you're asked a hypothetical question, um, don't, don't um, give in to the, the reporters urging to speculate about that. They will cross that bridge when we come to it. Or say, I can't answer a hypothetical question, but here's what I can tell you. Here's what we're doing right now. Don't speak outside your area of expertise. Um, I don't know is a perfectly good answer. Um, if you should know or if it's within your area of responsibility, you can offer to find out. Or you can refer the reporter to the proper source. For example, if it's a question for law enforcement officials, you can say we're cooperating with law enforcement officials and they can answer that question for you. So um, don't try to be so helpful that you end up, uh, you don't want to guess and you don't want to, you don't want to speak for someone else. Uh, don't include too much detail in your answers or make them long and rambling because they're going to get cut. You're trying to explain um, sometimes complex information very simply. And your audience may not be um, familiar with, with the subject matter, um, especially when you're speaking in the news media, you're going to have a lot of people who, who aren't going to be familiar with um, chart, church jargon or acronyms or those sorts of things. So don't say that you're a DS for the United Methodist Church or um, a, an annual conference may be a term that they're not familiar with that may, um, that may signal an a yearly meeting to them. So be sure that you're uh, not using unfamiliar words or phrases and you want to be clear and concise and keep your answers simple. Now we've really just scratched the surface of this topic. Right. There's a lot of there's a lot of information. So we have a couple of resources to give you more information. Uh, one is the handbook that I referred to earlier. And um, this was de this was developed by United Methodist Communications as especially for churches, so it's not the same as some other media resources that you might find. Um, it gives you a step-by-step -step reference guide so you can keep it in your desk if, if it's, so it's handy when you need it. It has to hold responses in there. Um, and this guide is available at shop.umc.org, so you can get it there. Um, in addition to that, United Methodist Communications offers two different face-to-face -face training courses that can help you build your skills. Uh, one is media relations training, where you have an opportunity to have um, um, learn more about these skills, about dealing with reporters, um, opportunities to have on-camera interview, and then you can get some individual coaching um, to help you. Um, now, we do these classes either uh, on-site or if you have a group, um, then um, for costs we can come and do it on-site um, in your area. The second is a crisis response and planning course, and that provides not only on-camera training, um, but also more detailed information about crisis strategies and also the templates that I mentioned that would help you easily develop a crisis plan um, using these templates. So it saves a lot of work. Is that training best for individuals or teams? Like if the district superintendent was to form a crisis team, 
would it be better to do that first and then for the team to do the training all together? It's great for a team, and when you have it all together in one conference, then that really signals that this is, you know, this is something we take mm -hmm. seriously and it's important. Um, you know, sometimes that doesn't work, or there's always, um, or there's someone new who comes on board and there's already been training. So in that case, we offer training, and uh, you know, the individuals can come to here at United Methodist Communications in Nashville, and um, so that is available as well. And I'm imagining that uh, doing this would be part of a be best done as part of an integrated whole approach with the whole annual conference communicator so that whatever you're planning to do on the district, make sure that you have your your conference communications director uh, and, and bishop in the loop so that it's all developed in concert with them. Right. That's, that's, that's where you want to start your conversation, find out what's already in place, make sure that you know where you fit into that. Um, if, if, if there aren't those, if that's not already in place, to talk about how to do that and, and um, you know, where we can help you. So we're certainly glad to, to give you some advice about that. Um, and at this point, I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Excellent. Well, thank you, Diane. This has been great. And we're still well within our allotted hour. So I'm going to turn to Jason and ask, uh, Jason, have we had any questions come in from our participants? Thank you, Myron. Yes, we do have a few, and I'll just remind folks that you can send in your questions using the Q&A panel on the right-hand side of your screen, just around your name. You'll see the question mark icon, and when you click on that question mark icon, that's how you send us your questions. We'll do our best to answer as many of those during our remaining time together. Great. So, uh, so we've had a few questions come in around the area of, of preparation. And uh, the theme being that for those that are just starting to put together a communications team, uh, how many, where do we get people from, what resources are already in place, especially if we're operating with a small team? Well, uh, for, so for every crisis, you're going to want to consider who you want on your team. And there are some people who you'll always have on your team probably, like your communicator. and um, and your team leader, but um, for example, if you have camping ministries and you have a camping crisis, then you're going to need to make sure you have the person who's in charge of that on your team. Um, in the crisis template that we offer as part of the training, we have crises um, categorized, um, for example, uh, around an accident, uh, around a financial situation. And we suggest who you will want on your crisis team as a result of that. So it can vary. Um, it can vary based on that kind of crisis. And so that is going to be part of your plan. And um, thinking through who it is that you're going to need to help you make those decisions and give you that information, or who, who's got a role. Uh, remembering you've got more than one audience. So sometimes you know one person is handling the media audience, but who is handling? Um, the issues with the congregation, and the church audience, and um, and that that may be a different person who's communicating to that audience. So you want to think about who you need, and we offer some suggestions for that in in the template. And another um, piece that I was keenly aware of is just going back to Diane's earlier uh, example of when she was faced with a crisis, and it so happened that her administrative assistant was not present that day. Just the importance of having your administrative assistants in the loop and ha giving giving them especially the, the template uh, information, the, the prepared statements, so that they know what to respond to on the phone calls and what not to respond to on the phone calls. That would be critically important because my, my assumption, I think it's safe, is that most of those folks don't see themselves as trained and equipped to do that ordinarily and they would need a special uh, training and also reassurance of how to handle those touchy situations. Um, and if you if you um, take advantage of the crisis training, then um, we also offer um, uh, a training presentation that can be done for frontline staff mm -hmm. um, in addition to the template so that you've got that training um, resource also. Excellent. Is there another question? Yes, the next thread of questions is around internal communications. And as folks are putting their communication process in, in place and building those teams, um, how do they communicate to the churches in their districts and the programs that in their districts 
regarding what that process is and, and who to call and what to do in case of a crisis or an emergency. Um, so I would say that you, you know, ideally you would have local church crisis plans also that would tell them, you know, start with a, a media policy so they know when do you want to know about a situation that's happening. You don't want to hear about it on the news yourself. Um, you know, all too often people who need to know don't find out until it's imminent. And so being aware of those things that are that are happening, make sure that the people who report to you know what what your expectations are. And then, um, you know, ideally having plans that, that are all integrated, a local church plan, a district level plan, an annual conference level plan. Um, if, you, if you can't make that happen, you at least want to make sure that everybody is keeping you informed and knows what's expected of them. Um, consider what resources you've got available to you and work with your uh, conference communicator, um, you know, if there are concerns about that. If there's a more specific question, um, I'm happy to address that also. I'm seeing some uh, follow-up questions along those lines, Diane. In putting these plans together, are there some resources that are already available to help, help us identify what plans we need and, and what gaps there are? And then I'll come back with the second part of the question. Well, we have, of course, the reference guide here, which helps you through a, helps you through, um, a crisis. But, um, um, you know, you're, you're, the first step is to find out, do you, have a, do you have a conference communication plan? That's the first step. Because if you already have one, then those things may already be in place. Um, if you don't have a conference communication plan, then um, you need to consider, um, you know, attending the training or having someone attend the training and and beginning to work on the the template. So to start that process, you need some commitment from your top leadership. Um, this, this is an important thing, and we're going to do it. Um, that is when it works best. Is when when the bishop says, you know, I consider this to be important, and I want everybody to take it seriously. And then I'd form a committee of people. To begin work on the plan. You can take the template to start with and then see how that might need to be adapted, um, who you've got to, to fill in those roles, and then, you know, what are what are the gaps there? Who needs to be trained? Do you have people who are trained as those people? Do you have people who, who would be good at that? Do you have people who um, connect with people? But, you know, folks, folks people are made, not born. You know, there are some people who who are naturally great spokespeople, but there are other people who just learn, um, you know, who can just learn, you know, what the news media is looking for, what to expect, and how to adapt to those rules, how to adapt your communication style for the rules that apply in media situations. Um, so put together a team of people to start looking at that, and, um, you know, we can to come up with something. And our next set of questions is around working with the bishop. And the general theme of the questions are, how as a DS should I go about um, identifying the needs and getting our communications plan and process up to speed and helping the bishop to understand the needs in that area? Well, I always kind of start with with telling people, you know, think about what the headline is going to read if something were to happen, um, and, you know, do you want this headline or do you want something else? So these crisis situations are, are going to happen, and um, we want to be prepared to meet them because um, it can really impact our, our, you know, it can really impact you long term, your organization long term if you don't communicate well. Not just with the news media, but your internal audiences. If there's not effective communication, it can affect a congregation for years to come. So, um, you know, I would, I would, you can, you can look at. Um, I mean, it, it doesn't take a minute probably for me to find uh, situations of many churches that are in the news. Not necessarily, um, not necessarily our churches, but churches that are facing crisis. There are so many categories of crisis that that might impact us because um, you're assisting uh, vulnerable populations. And so whenever you have, um, 
vulnerable populations, you have the possibility of crisis. So assess your vulnerabilities. You know, what are the kinds of ministries that you have where you're serving people, like um, daycares and camps or homeless ministries or things like that. And, and those are all potential situations that might, that might create a problem. Um, you know, and then I would, you know, express concern that you don't know, you know, what your role is and you want to be well prepared. You know, now is the time to start. And I, I would say that <clears throat> uh, also perhaps proposing uh, that uh, the the cabinet that you work with take 50 to 60 minutes to, to view this, this webinar together uh, would be a good introduction for the whole cabinet. Uh, and you could do that over a working lunch or something like that as a way of getting everybody talking about it and hearing the same uh, the same possibilities for collaboration to develop a conference-wide uh, media plan. And that way, it's not just putting it back on the bishop's office, but rather uh, the cabinet coming together saying, how can we do this together so that we all help each other uh, do our best and look our best uh, when a crisis arises for any one of us? Uh, you know, starting with your, you know, your conference communicators, because uh, they, you know, are, are your your best resource, really, for um, helping to develop this strategy, I think. And, and that's assuming, I mean, that's assuming that every conference has one. I guess it's safe right. to assume that not everyone does. And, and so that's, that's where I would say go back to your, your cabinet and talk, talk through it about how, how much of a priority this is for you all and how you want to go about doing it together to pool your resources. And, and uh, if, if, even if you don't have a conference communicator, it may be, um, that especially if you have some churches in a metropolitan area that you will have some uh, folks in one of those congregations that is related to local news media and that could could help connect you with informed local sources to, of people who, who may actually be United Methodist and uh, media savvy and would be willing to help form a district committee or a conference committee on uh, crisis communications and, and lead that charge. And, you know, we're here at United Methodist Communications to help you, and so um, we often offer consultation when a crisis situation hits. Um, what I want you to think about, though, is how, how you can prevent some of these situations from happening or how you can be better prepared when it does happen by, by dealing with it now. And so if, there's, um, if I can consult with you about that or, or help you in any way, then um, my... Um, Contact information, I think, is on the screen here. Are there other questions, Jason? Uh, yep, the one more, uh, and I'll just remind folks that the resources that Diane has offered, uh, if you look in your chat window, I've placed those links right there in the chat window. Those are active links, so you can click on those anytime. It'll take you right to those pages, as well as as soon as we finish this webinar today, you'll automatically be redirected to the page to start learning about these tools and templates and the training opportunities that are available for you. So our last question is around the theme of rapid communication. And um, can you speak to how we could use Twitter to help us get the word out and what that might look like internally facing and externally facing? Well, uh, the first thing I'll say is Twitter can help you monitor for a crisis. And I, I know when Twitter was uh, kind of new and I was, um, I used to just spend some time on Sundays on there because sometimes there would be people talking about the church on Twitter that weren't talking about it for the rest of the week. And I actually, um, by looking at the chatter on Twitter, knew about a crisis that had happened at a church. Um, so um, it's a good place to monitor. Um, having these social media channels that you um, control is important to have them already set up and already have a following. It's too late to do that once you're into a crisis. So being sure that you've established a presence um, through your website, your Facebook page, your uh, Twitter account so that you can use that to communicate um, if, you, if you need to. Now, you know, Twitter is um, where a lot of people go when something's happening to find out what the buzz is, you know, before it's, before it's confirmed. So you want to make sure that you've got the facts before you're, um, you know, before you're just tweeting about it um, because that is, um, 
you know, that's a place where chatter is just happening, and um, it's useful to go there and see what people are saying about the situation. Um, so you can see if there are rumors, if there's misinformation, all those sorts of things, and then you can use that channel to set, to set those straight. Um, it should be integrated with the rest of your message, though. So as you're thinking about your audiences, who are you who are you talking to, and what channels will you use to reach them? And that you know that's one channel that you can consider if that's a good place to reach people. Um, you know, I would consider that along with the rest because um, it is a, a quick way to communicate, um, and it's a quick way to find out you know what people are saying and thinking about mm -hmm. it. So you might need to adjust your message as you monitor you know, what people are saying or what questions you're getting, um, you know, what the buzz is, um, so that you can make sure your messages are relevant and, and whether they need to be adjusted as the crisis um, goes on. When you're dealing with a crisis, you want to kind of stay ahead of the curve so that you're proactive and not reactive. You want to think about, you know, what's the next thing that might happen once you address it initially, um, because there might be a next step in the life cycle. So think proactively about that and how you can head that off. I think in, generally in communications for, for district superintendents, that's a very good stop and pause question is, is my response going to be a reactive response or is it going to really come across as a thoughtful, proactive response to whatever the situation is? And more often than not, reactive responses stand a larger chance of going the wrong way, of, of, of uh, creating other responses or reactions that you really don't want. So be very thoughtful about that. I think that's, that's one of the best pieces of advice in this whole webinar. <laughs> any other any other uh, questions? We had one comment from a viewer uh, that says, people are, are already on Twitter talking about you in the church. And so um, do you have any general advice for those that are reluctant to embrace the technology and, and start getting out there with a proactive message? Um, people are already on Twitter talk, uh, talking about the church in general. We're talking about this webinar. Talking about the church in general. So the, the <laughs> theme of the question is for those for those churches and people that are reluctant to say, for instance, sign on Twitter and get a Twitter account set up and using that. Uh, this comment is people are already out there talking about you, so you might as well be out there putting a proactive message. So how do we help sell that to to folks and get them on board? Well, you know, the advent of social media has changed the face of public relations forever, um, and in a good way, because, um, um, you know, before you had to get a reporter's attention in, or, in order to talk to your audiences, and then you had to filter the message through the reporter and try to tell the story that you want to tell. Social media allows us to talk directly to our audiences. Um, it does create some additional problems, because there are some crises that are related to social media, because Everyone who um, has something to say has a, has a channel in which they can say it. And social media doesn't have the same rules that journalism has. In journalism, you know, they have to tell both sides of the story. You've got to confirm your information, you know, usually two or three sources to confirm something. Um, sometimes things on social media um, are not factual. Um, but it's, you know, there's an opportunity there. There's an opportunity to talk directly to far more people than we were ever able to talk to before. Um, and some different audiences. You know, there's some audiences that you'll reach through the news media. There are other audiences that don't get their news through the news media anymore. Um, and you can talk directly to them. So, you know, build that following ahead of time so that it's an asset for you to use when you, when you want to communicate. Um, you can, you can talk to them directly. And there are, you know, very, very active conversations um, about the United Methodist Church on Twitter, on Facebook. Um, so be listening ahead of time. Listen to what people are saying about you and uh, be prepared with a strategic response if necessary. Excellent. Thank you. All right. Well, just keeping an eye on the time, Myron, uh, I'll go ahead and ask you to close us up for today. Well, uh, on behalf of uh, Again, General Board of Higher Education and Ministry and uh, United Methodist Communications, we thank you for joining us today. And we thank you, Jason, for uh, hosting us. And we hope this has been helpful. We do hope that you'll spread the word that this will soon be available for um, everyone to uh, look at and to learn from. 
And we would appreciate your feedback. Any, any responses you want to continue to give us after the webinar, we would welcome that. And the information for communicating those is there on your screen right now. And uh, I'd say, uh, based on the, the experience I've had working with these folks, that if uh, I was facing a crisis, I'd want both Jason and Diane on my team. Uh, and I hope uh, you find uh, a good, good response in your context, wherever you are, in forming your communication strategies or your district and your annual conference. Diane, anything else you want to add to that? Thank you very much for your uh, for attending today, and um, please let us know if we can if we can ever uh, be of assistance. Thanks. Thank you.